So we're going to All right, so section one, the uh, history and the environment of diving. So the earliest recorded skin diving attempts were over 3,000 years ago. So long, long time ago, people have been doing skin diving or some version of scuba diving. The original reason to, to dive uh, was to recover sunken treasure. Very TV show worthy. So a lot of people think that it's food or whatever, but for thousands of years, cargo has been carried on shipwrecks, or not shipwrecks, has been carried on ships uh, across the ocean, and pretty regularly those ships sank, and either the original owner or a salver wanted to get that treasure back or whatever the valuables were back from that shipwreck, and that was the reason for divers wanting to go underwater initially. Now, you need to know also or think about the fact that Historically, people, not everybody knew how to swim. It's almost a life skill here today, but back then they thought sea monsters existed and very dangerous things were in the ocean. Uh, so it took a very hardy, aggressive person to be willing to go underwater and risk fighting these sea monsters and everything else. Now we think that most everybody can do scuba diving. So we have 70-year-old people scuba diving with us. We have 10-year-old scuba diving with us, so it's not that big of a deal now. Um, you just have to kind of do it right. In 1943, Jacques Cousteau and Emile Gagnon invented the demand regulator. What the demand regulator did was it allowed for the first use of scuba diving. Do you all know what scuba diving or scuba stands for? Any guesses? What was it? It was, um... oh God, I can't remember. Okay, so scuba is self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. So what that means is that in 1943 was the first real use or the real time that a diver could be self-contained. He could carry a tank on his back and move around whichever way he wanted to, but he could carry everything he needed to dive. This demand regulator, what that did was that when the diver demanded air, the regulator provided air. So when he inhaled, it gave him air. When he didn't inhale, it wasted air. Before this, we had surface applied air. So think of a a diver on or a diver underwater with a really long hose running to shore and a crew of men pumping air down to that diver, but the diver can only stay go to where his hose will reach and when his, it takes a crew of people doing it. Scuba, scuba lets the diver swim around, do his own thing to some extent. In 1957, the U.S. Navy released dive tables. Now, before these dive tables were released, occasionally or regularly a diver would go down and he would come up with what was called the bends. And this bends is related to the diver staying down too long or going down too deep and coming up and the bubbles coming out of solution and causing problems. We'll go into the bends a little bit later, but what this dive table release did was it gave a chart of if you go down this deep, you can only stay down this long. It's basically depth versus time. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about that in a good bit more detail later on. In 1959, the first dive computers were developed. These dive computers was the first real use of a diver kind of being able to program things on the fly. Now one of the big differences with SDI is that we teach dive computers and not dive tables. So she's holding a dive table of sorts in her hand. These are hard. <laughs> they are hard and they take a good bit of calculation. I equate that sort of to long division. So when I took math in high school, I learn long division with a pen and paper. But now as an adult, if I need to do long division and I don't have a calculator, I'm probably just going to wait till I find the calculator. <laughs> I'm not really going to do it with a pen and paper. There's almost zero chance. Same thing with diving is I'm going to use a dive computer. I'm going to let it do the math for me. Why not do it the, the way that it's going to be exactly right and we know it's going to be good? Now, the instructor manual for this program tells me to tell you that the first exposure most people have to scuba diving was during the 1950s and 60s TV show Sea Hunt. So the first time that you've probably seen scuba diving was during this 1950s and 60s TV show. I had taught hundreds of these classes and never seen a Sea Hunt episode. I wasn't alive in 1950 or 1960. So what I'm going to do here in a minute is I'm going to show you a Sea Hunt episode. So in this particular Sea Hunt episode, there's a rich guy that wants to learn to dive. And so he's contracted this, this scuba instructor to teach him how to dive. Now, 
there, now this is not strictly an instructional video. It's a 1950s or 60s television show. Okay, so there's some some things to learn from it, but I'm not using this as necessarily an instructional uh, video. Now, there's there's some differences between this TV show and Modern Diving. For one, they can't make a TV show about two divers that went and had a great time diving. There's got to be a little bit of drama. There's got to be a little bit of danger in this. Okay, so there's going to be that. Uh, there's also the weird 1950s and 60s man-woman dynamic of how people got along and how that, you know, kind of applied then. Skip over all that. Forget all that stuff. Um, also, one of the reasons this guy wants to learn to dive is that he wants to hunt a giant squid and a shark. That's his reason for learning to dive. Now, most divers hope to see a shark. It's the highlight of their dive, and they might want to dive for years. They might dive for years before they ever get to dive with their first shark. But it's a really exciting point for them. We're not hunting sharks. We want to river, you know, you know, really enjoy the shark and the interaction with the shark. Uh, now, for what it's worth, the, well, we'll talk about sharks and, and aquatic animal stuff a little bit kidding. later on. No, I know, but we'll talk about that later on. But most divers are really excited to see their first shark. Now, if you watch TV movies now and you see a shark now. It's almost always the same species of shark. It's going to be the black tip reef shark, and it's almost always filmed with one particular dive resort that are kind of the, the movie shark people, okay? Um, and they're wild sharks, but they're sharks that this dive resort have kind of trained in that they use these sharks, but they're still wild sharks, but they're almost always black tip reef sharks. In this particular episode, the shark that they're using really is a dangerous shark. It's an oceanic white tip shark. It's not the friendly TV shark. It's a honest to goodness wild shark. So we're going to see if we can get this video to play and if not we'll pause things and get this video to play. just for the sport of it doesn't appeal to me very much. Well, now, look, I understand that you and Snyder here need money to keep your research project going. How much? $5,000. Well, that's considerably more than a job is worth. However, it is a worthy cause. And tax deductibles. That's right, go ahead. All right, $2,500 now to balance when I get my first shark. A deal? I have Dr. Gomez. I have been 
everything on her eyes almost dead. No, why? I have a patient in the village, a child, very sick. I must take her to the hospital. I must ask to borrow your aeroplane at once, senor. Oh, of course, I'll, I'll speak to my father right away. Gracias, senor. Oh, Dr. Gomez, don't you have any kind of a hospital here in Puerto Blanco? No, senor. We have only the hotel and the fishing. And now, if you would excuse me, please. What's the matter, Mr. Cowboy? Well, nothing. I was just thinking if something went wrong in the water. It won't. Now that we all follow the necessary precautions. My husband never does. You better. <laughs> so far under controlled conditions. We're going to have to go down to 70 or 80 feet for those shocks and up again. You don't know how yet. Well, what I know is I'm due back in New York in 10 days. I want a shark before I leave. It's not that easy. 75 feet down is a different world. Well, if I don't get my shark, 
You don't get the rest of that $5,000. Elliot, that's not fair. Mike spent everything he possibly can. Shall we get started with those lessons? in the country. He studied in France with Le Corbusier. It was there that it happened. And what happened? His father was killed in an auto accident. Elliot inherited $112 million and the Conway Oil Corporation. How do rich men work? He doesn't see any reason to. Not yet, anyway. So in the meantime, he makes for the muscle and uh, lives dangerously, huh? I guess. He can't be scolded into growing up. I found that out too late. Gloria, Gloria, I wanted to show you my new spear gun. It's one of the best you can buy. They have a coke on it like that, huh? I haven't checked you out on it yet. Will you put it down, please? Nelson, for a hired hand, you're getting a little bit out of line, don't you think? Put it down, will you? I've been handling firearms since I was 10 years old. It doesn't look like it. The gun is cocked and ready to shoot. I also read the instructions to fire it. You have to release the thing. Oh, put it down. All right. <laughs> She shows up to it. I said to her, how are you feeling now? I feel fine, but I'm terribly hungry. Good. I love you. I'll order dinner. I thought we might try the chicken cacciatore. No, no, that's too spicy. It'll upset Stemmings tomorrow. Not the best we're going. You shouldn't have said that. Now I'll order two portions just to prove how tough he is. I shouldn't have said that. Well, he does seem to be trying. 
Maybe some of that uh, underneath stuff that you were talking to me about is beginning to show through. Well, suddenly I just don't care anymore. I made a bad mistake when I married him. And a worse one later on. Uh, it's probably just this place. After you get home. Home? Home's just a refueling station for dreams of parties. This will make you uh, Maybe things will be different now, huh? Maybe you have to refuel us a shock or two? I hope so, please. You're sweet. considered. We can call the whole thing off now. Really? Well, sure. We don't have to do it today or even this trip. We can come back. So I thought you meant. responsibility for other people on a shark hunt is really harrowing. I pointed to the sharks and I moved toward them with a bait. I knew they probably wouldn't attack us right away. They were diving onto something new to them.
It's a miracle. She wasn't killed. All because I wanted some lousy pictures. Also because Dr. Gomez wanted to borrow that plane of yours. Well, say, why don't they have a hospital here? What is it, money? It usually is. Well, it wouldn't take too much. And there's a wonderful natural site for it on that rise near the shore. You know, a small hospital. Uh, two stories, maybe 20 or 30 beds. Something like that. Uh, she said that you studied to be an architect. You'd be a great one, she said. Then you're a Yes. 
I should think that you would know better than to permit a woman in her position. Well, look, how is she? She's my wife. She is quite all right. I will speak with you later. Perhaps you did not know how dangerous it was for her to descend to such depths. But he should have known. About what? That you do not subject an expectant mother to. A uh, what? You did not know. Oh, well, this is the first I've heard of it. In six months. Congratulations, senor. Well, well, can I go see her now? No. It is better that she rest. And I would suggest that as soon as you return to the States, you have her in a hospital for observation. Yes, that, that's where she should be now, isn't it? There is no hospital nearer than 300 miles. Well, there will be, Doctor. I can promise you that. Doctor, work will start before my child is born. I promise. Uh, Layla, take that long just to draw up the plans. I'm like, you don't know me when I go to work. Your wife's going to like that. I did. Very much. Bless you, Sid. Do you know who the guy learning to dive was? Larry Hagman. I think Larry he was. Uh, that is who it was. Yeah, I dream of Gene. So Major Tony Nelson. So. All right. How are y'all doing? Everybody awake? Yep. Okay. So there's going to be some things that you'll immediately notice different about the water. One of the things that objects are going to appear 25% closer and 33% larger. Any guesses on how this could affect you like early in your scuba diving career? What do you think? That's, that's exactly right. So here sitting in the classroom, you know how long your arms are. You know what you can reach. I know that I can reach this remote, but I can't barely reach that yellow paper because I've been doing it for a long time. But underwater, you'll reach for something and you just can't quite get to it. Now, how about the larger? How do you think the larger could affect you? It might not affect you, but do you any, any ideas for who it might affect? So spear fishermen. Usually there's minimum size limits to spearfish, meaning the fish has to be this big before you can bring it up. And there's very little catch and release in spearfishing. So a spear fisherman might shoot something, bring it up, and then suddenly it's smaller than he thought it was. So it makes spearfishing a little bit more, more complicated. Uh, also, and you can see this in some of my photos up here. So notice how some of the photos look really, really blue and then some of it, well, some of them look kind of normal colored and things. But even like, let's say this photo, every, the diver there looks completely blue. His face looks blue. His face really isn't blue. But what happens is the color red and yellow and pink and all that gets filtered out because of the depth. But now some of the photos that you see, like this photo, you see the yellow and you see the other colors because the diver is using a flash there and it brings the color back. So right here, this diver's helmet is, that's actually me, but this diver's helmet has a blue tint to it. You see the blue tint? But if you look at this photo out of the water, the, hel the helmet is bright yellow. So it, it, and it's just that there wasn't a flash and enough light coming through, filtering through. So anyway, what light gets filtered out and the color that appears in the rainbow. So Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, blue, and violet. So the deeper and deeper you go, the bluer things are going to look or the less color you're going to have. But it's not if you carry a flashlight or if you have a, a, a flash on your camera called a strobe underwater, it's not the distance, it's not the depth that matters, it's the distance through the water the light has to travel. So the sunlight traveling from the surface down through 100 feet of water, everything's going to look blue. 
but if you have a flashlight or a, a, a strobe on your camera, it's only traveling, if I'm taking your photo underwater, the light's only traveling from me to you, reflecting off you and back to my camera lens, and then that'll bring the color back so you'll look normal again. So another interesting difference, and this is something you'll notice right away, is water gets, the, the, the water is 800, you're not going to necessarily notice the, the density as far as the 800 times part, but you've all been in the water and you feel how slowly you move through it and things like this. It's because of the density of the water. But this also adds to some neat things about the water, okay, or the neat things about diving. So none of us, or at least not that I'm aware of, are acrobats here in um, here in the classroom, but in the water in the water if the if the classroom right now were filled with water, I could take a deep breath, and I would slowly hover up out of my chair. I could do flips and rolls and all the things that I can't do here. But it's just because of the de the density of the water being different, so it adds some neat stuff to the to our abilities. So water is eight hundred times denser than air and it conducts sound further and faster as well. So in the, in the classroom, as far as the further and faster, right now, if you were to close your eyes and point at me, and I walked around the room talking, you could keep pointing at me with your eyes closed. Do you know how that works? Any guesses? Um, because to your ears, that is my job. That's exactly right. So in very simple terms, one ear hears the sound first, and your brain translates that in the direction. But underwater, because of how much faster sound is traveling, you can't really tell which ear hears it first. So you'll hear things from a really long distance away, but you'll have no idea which way, which direction it's coming from. All right, so another difference is how much faster heat is transferred away from your body. So Right here in the classroom, um, it's 70 degrees or 72 degrees, something like that. And we're all comfortably, we could live happily ever after in 70 degree water. If we jump in a swimming pool at 70 degrees, we're going to immediately feel chilly. It's going to feel pretty cold and we're not going to, we're going to, after an hour or so, we're going to be cold and probably want to get out. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the heat transfer. Um, a friend, well, actually, Jennifer's roommate and her did a polar bear plunge last winter, really the first of fall, okay? And it was kind of interesting because I used it as a, a few teaching moments with them, but the particular day we went to the quarry and they did their polar bear plunge, which is on YouTube if y'all want to look this up too, but if you, at one point, the roommate said, uh, I'm glad it's a warm day because the water will be warmer. And I said, no, the water's much, much colder. The air is pretty comfortable right now, but you're going to be colder in the water. And she also backed into a metal pole, and the metal pole felt very, very cold to her. But the metal, co the metal pole, it was air temperature. It was, you know, 70 or 60 or whatever it was. But because it's metal and the metal transferred heat away from your body quicker, it felt, it felt very chilly, but it was actually the same temperature as the air, but the air didn't, you didn't feel it. You know, if you pick up a bottle of water and pour water on you, it's going to feel cold, even though it's room temperature. This is room temperature water, but it's still going to feel chilly. What was what, what were you saying? It went to chilly. Did you like the country 